goes over to Kurt and also Carl. If Carl's more than willing to participate, if he is, Carl. Carl went on two trips to facilities. Uh, Sarah, <coughs> Butch, and I <coughs> went on one of those trips. <coughs> Um, so we have a little, and Joe, Asia, you went to Maine and Concord. With the both, that is correct. With both. So there was, <coughs> Maine was the first one that Kurt went to by himself as a committee member, and BGS and DOC then went there. Yes. And we don't have anybody from DOC, can't do it. Oh, well, that's all right. Um, and then Kurt went to Concord, and then, th did you go to Concord separate, or was that all of us that went there? No, I don't think you we all went with us. Yeah. So then, um, Carl then, well, Carl went up to Maine. Went to Maine. With BGS and DOC. And then we went to Concord. There was Carl, Carl, Kurt, Carl, Carl, and Kurt. You two, Butch, myself, and Sarah with BGS and DOC folks. And then Kurt took a trip to Michigan for some reason and thought, well, I'll stop at a correctional facility there. And then he went to Alaska to visit his daughter, and so I'll stop at a correctional facility there. Have you seen any in Canada yet? You did, didn't you? No, but I'd like to. Oh, I went to one in Nova Scotia years ago. Um, at the same time, Kurt did the shadow of a correctional officer day in the summer, the beginning of the summer. What facility was that? Chittman. 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 Yeah. And then Carl has been working a lot on, um, was it more mm -hmm. MAT or was it more just? It's more baseline facility stuff. So I went to four other, four of our prisons this summer, observed the MAT line in all of them, and then also spoke with staff and then also spoke with PNP people in the local local PNP office. So we thought this would be a good, uh, way for the committee to kind of catch up on some of this and put in perspective maybe what's out there, what people were finding and seeing and <coughs> kind of overview of what's going on in corrections. And we did it this afternoon because we weren't sure what was going to happen on the floor. Um, one thing before we get started, we always have folks who are sitting around and sometimes we know folks and sometimes we don't. And so if we ask questions of anyone around, um, we just ask you to okay, uh, at, say your name first, at least so it's on the record, so your voice is recognizable and where you're from. And we're going to work, Phil's going to be at some point setting up a clipboard to send around so you can just sign up so that we know who's here for the items. Anyone have to get one of questions? Uh, yeah? Yeah? I would like to introduce one of our new employees with Buildings and General Services. Oh, good. Oh, good. We're going to have a day to introduce all your new folks, too, at some point. I don't want to lose that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. No, but this is good. This is Jeremy Stevens. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy is my new program chief. He's the, well, for those who knew Mike Coon, uh -huh. mm -hmm. backfield Mike Coon's position. Oh, wow. So this is his first introductory from into this world. So not it's not bad. a good day to beat him up. But. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll think of a good initiation for you. <laughs> I've told him stories. Oh, good. Oh, God. Thank you. <laughs> so, Kurt. Kurt, it's all yours. You don't have to sit up there unless you really want to. Well, we well, want actually, we... I'll probably end up standing <clears throat> to point the thing. I, I oh, okay. stay Whatever here. works for you. I'll stay here. That's good. I was going to put my feet on his chair. <laughs> As he does on yours. When you know. Seriously, though, folks. Okay. <laughs> this was this is Maine. Um, with the women's unit, which is part of the this is the men's areas here. It has a fence around it. So there's a woman's unit within the men's. And there's also a reentry facility. And these two are the primary ones that I visited. Although we also walked all the way down through all this, which is kind it, of. Is the woman's unit connected to that, physically to the building that houses this? This one here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Do they use common space at all, or do they have separate space in the woman's unit? They have separate. 
separate like te like dining and medical and yes yeah. totally yes. separate totally yeah, their own infirmary and everything okay yeah. there is another unit there's a small smaller woman's kind of a wing part of i think it must be this one Carl, correct me if I'm wrong. I think wrong. that's correct. It's it was right. Um, so booking and uh, booking is right, the, uh, just the farther the farthest to the bottom of it, and then there's a there's a uh, living block. Oh, uh -oh. I don't know how to operate that thing. Oh, oh I think it, okay. Is there, oh, there's the air. Okay, so. That is booking right there, uh -huh. and then up in here there are two living blocks, and one of them is reserved for women uh, who are close custody or <coughs> whatever. So they've got to maintain that sight, uh -huh. sight, sight and sound, sound. Uh -huh. separation. So it's a pain for them when they bring people in because they, then they've got to clear that whole corridor there. And, yeah, uh -huh. but the the women's unit itself. It's connected by an outdoor um, chain link fence walkway, I believe, and that's it. And how many beds do they have in there? 100. And then 100 <coughs> down at the right. re entry site. Yeah. Is it 100 total? Is it yeah. the only facility, period, in Maine, it, like for men and women? Uh, no, is for women it is. For women it is. There's several other total. men's facilities. How many beds is the, uh, women, is the men's part? Yeah. Don't know. I think it's something like 500. <coughs> so, if I recall so in Maine, does not have a unified system either. Do they? Right. They have a county system. So they're getting sentence folks. They're not getting detainees. Mm -hmm. Is this the only state facility? For women. It? For women, yes. For we but for men, do they have another? No, they have a number of them. For men. Yeah. yeah. So they have total 200 beds for women. 100 is within a more incarcerative setting and the other one is used for reentry for women Correct. that they have to earn to get to the reentry. Yes. So you got two hundred beds today. So it's important to remember, especially when you see the picture of the reentry facility, that it is a reentry facility. It's so it's very different from this and any and other units. Mm -hmm. It's about twenty five minutes from downtown Portland means it's fairly close to a big city uh, and the population is about a half a million it's the only state one when it's open in 2002 um, and the reentry facility is really newer 2017 and it is a okay I'm sorry that's right. the question so that's an overview of, of the main in uh, facility in window this is what it looks like, the re-entry facility. Um, a lot of attention to design and making it warm and notice there's no chain link fence or razor wire around it. Um, uh, 96 bed was what I had. It's minimum custody. The, when I was there in the middle of the day, uh, about half the inmates were out working. So um, off campus? Off campus, yep. Yeah. How did they get to their jobs? Do you know, was their transportation <coughs> provided by DOC or? That I'm not sure. I believe, I believe so. They have a bunch of vans <coughs> that get the women to work. And where would they work mostly? In Portland or just kind of around women? Do you know? I, well, there was the office across the street. I think there was a farm that they worked, a horse farm that they worked in. But there are also other jobs within the city. They have a culinary program in the facility that's run by a former White House pastry chef. Mm -hmm. And then they yeah, also the re within the reentry facility. And then they also have the laundry for the whole prison in the reentry facility as well. But then they've got women working at Dunkin' Donuts and places all around the greater Portland area. Did you have something, Joe? Yes. I'm uh, Joe Aja, Director of Designing Construction for BGS. Uh, yeah, the women not only do they have some transport, but they also and get an Uber or a cab, and that comes out of their pay. So, a, so they are paid for that to go out, but they also pay for their own rides. And when they're working <coughs> on the outside, like at Dunkin' Donuts, they're getting paid like the regular minimum wage, Correct. the regular salary, 
<coughs> that is correct. Um, high level of freedom contingent on personal accountability. So, and actually, they I asked about um, diversion of drugs, and they said they they don't have a problem with it because they they do more drug testing than the whole state combined. And as soon as you have a dirty drug test, you go back up the hill to the other place. So these people are, it's the incentive to come down. Again. The other thing is that up on the hill, they can see this place, and they can and they know about it. So, so the people who are in the other facility have some motivation to, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be in here? And they know it's a nice place. But inside, it's much like a college dormitory. It actually felt like a library when I was in there because half the people were gone. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, they, they, you know, they had trouble apparently in designing it because they forgot to put blinds on the windows up here and there's a hill that comes down and uh -huh. lights would shine in and people could see them and things like that. But basically the, the design is very modern and very warm inside. Uh, real particular attention to the colors and the moods that that brings about. So that's the women's uh, re-entry facility in Maine. So, Kurt, before we, <clears throat> for the drug testing, were the women, when they went out <coughs> the day they came back, was there any uh, type of search done or anything to see if any contraband was coming back in or any, or when was the drug testing? That, I, I don't know the specifics of that. I suspect that there was quite a bit because she said they were tested very frequently. Uh, yeah, but they've had very few dirty tests. Very few dirty. <laughs> and I'm also wondering, too, how many of them have substance abuse issues or opioid issues mm -hmm. and that type of thing, too. I'm just curious. Well, they did say that the uh, woman said she'd be very happy to come over and testify and get all the <laughs> real sure. specifics of it. But, uh, I mean, those yeah, are the layers that we deal with, yeah, and that's yeah. what we hear. Well, you know, they go out and they're going to bring all this contraband in. And, so it'd be nice to know sort of what they're processing. They are searched on the way back in. They are. Okay. Yeah, Strip? There's an area where they have to get processed. Kind strip of or pat? It was at least pat, but I think it's still a strip. I'm not 100% sure. <coughs> yeah, uh, Joe, don't hesitate to jump no, in. No, I understand. Fine. It's just that, yeah, they, yeah, when they come back in, they do have one process point that they are riding to. Uh, whatever you're going to say. At the cost of the facility, I remember you, you emailed something about this, but I can't remember. Ten how million. Was, yes. Ten million. So Ten million, and their annual expenses for power, natural gas, and city water consumption are one hundred and thirty-eight thousand. So ten million for a hundred beds. Yeah. Hundred thousand beds, right? Yes. And a lot of that construction, the outside is a um, processed wood product with. Uh, it's open vented. You, you really can't see the vents in there, so it's a nice rain screen behind it. So it is potentially a very durable product, and as you, then it's insulated, and on the inside is regular sheetrock. No holes in the sheetrock? There's no holes. As you know, Kurt said, it's basically, it was like a library. It was a college dorm walking in there, very open, uh, and it's because of their freedom. They are allowed to, like on the right-hand side of the photo that you're looking at, it's sort of like a, a low, you know, three-foot-high gate. They're allowed out in there. There, with the day we showed up, they were out raking and cleaning, <coughs> mowing the lawn, and they're free to come and go when they're on that campus right there. Mm -hmm. So it's not as hard. Really. Right. Correct. And I, it seems like I saw some pictures of it inside that were. It's very open, airy. That's light. right. There's that pamphlet. Uh, yeah, there is okay. a pamphlet. I have a copy, but I, I can email it to you. I you go down a corridor and it opens up. Connor? Sorry. <coughs> Connor, Agency of Human Services, Cognitive. Um, we have like 35 photos that we took and we could share with the group that shows different areas of the building, if that's I, helpful. I think Mike Touchette showed me a few of those, and he was really pumped up about it uh, when he came back and said, you know, this is the direction we really need to go in. I'll, I'll send Phil the, the yeah. PDF of the pamphlet they give out. Because it's okay. part of part of the issue is putting it an environment that is very calming, mm -hmm. natural light, and I think that's true for both men and women, mm -hmm. and I yep. think it's true for the staff as well as the yep. inmates. Mm -hmm. 
But it's important to remember it's a re-entry facility. It's right. Right. Transi right. Tra right. Transitional housing type yeah, stuff. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they, they have irons, knives, things like that. It's, it's <laughs> not unlike. I just wanted to reiterate a point that Representative Taylor made: is the the having that other facility so close by, and the conversations we had was a very significant part of that whole process. They call it, you know, I'm finally going downhill, was something that a lot of the women spoke about the the ability to go down, and then, as you indicated, <laughs> you did not want to go back uphill. So. That incentive alone, um, they said, was you know the personal responsibility was pretty huge. So why did they do it just for the women and not the men? They have two reentry facilities for men. For men, yes. Not on on that no. site. No, no, they have Bolduc and uh, Mountain View. So did they go from this site to those? No, there. So there are two <laughs> regular men's prisons in Maine. There's this one in in Wyndham, and then there's the Maine State Prison in Warren, and then they have two pre-release facilities. The other thing that uh, I asked about and discussed was this is the what you see here is the place where inmates meet their kids. They come in, they don't come through any razor wire, they don't come through scanners and things like this. The, you know, you look out the window, you don't see a big high fence. It's and they said they get a lot more visitations from the family because because of that. So there's a lot of more connection between the family and the kids. How did the town react to that? They, I, there was, they said something like, uh, as long as you, they, they were in favor of it, from what I remember. And it was something like, as long as we can see it, or something, it was bizarre, or something a little bit strange that they said. But oh. it, was, it was well received. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, before they did it, um, Maine did this <coughs> study, which resulted in all this. Um, which is maybe the kind of study that we were talking about, a feasibility study that really looked at their whole system. Except I noticed at the beginning of this, they said that these consultants sat down with DOC and knew, or their DOC, and, and knew how many they wanted in each facility, which is one of our big questions, how many bids. But they did a really extensive study of the whole correction system and the flow and things. and, and uh, came out with a proposal for a bond, big bond issue for the state that would save $7 million a year once it got going, and the bond got voted down. But, so then they scaled it back and, and built pieces of it. Huh. Uh, oh, okay, I also have some more of me. This is the up on the hill part. So this is more, uh, this is comparable more to to Chitton, what Chittenden could be. And you can see there's a lot more windows and natural lighting, the artwork and things like that. The, there's two wings that go out, one out this way and one out that way with the central place here where you can get line of sight out both directions. And there's, so there's two levels each. With, what did you say, Carl? <coughs> So there's 25 on each floor. So each each hall, I believe, I don't. Some of them are four-person rooms. Some of them are two-person. But I think they're mostly four. Is that right, Joe? Do you remember that? I don't. Sorry. But they they've got a hundred there. So each quarter, there's I think there's 12 off of each side, and they're all dry. All dry, and none of the doors lock. Or the 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 doors lock. They have wooden doors. Yes, oh. they're, they're well, always all wooden hill, doors. So. It's, it's on, the on the hill, but they got wooden doors. Yeah. There. So what's the security level? I don't think so. Yeah. <coughs> what's the security level? Yeah. We should have had corrections in the room, but yeah. corrections yeah. in such turmoil right now. That I think it was. I think it was medium. Yeah. I believe it was medium because they've got. How many separations from the outside? <coughs> Well, this is inside the, the wire. Yeah, it's inside the it's inside the wire. Yeah, but even inside the wire, there's separation. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Inside that. <coughs> if, was if it I can pretty make... quiet in there when you went in like this? With something like this, was it pretty quiet? It should be two ways. It's uh, it's it it is rem it is <laughs> so different from uh, Chittenden. 
And you know how when you know you go to a prison, you can sort of you get a vibe from there. This was entirely different. And what vibe it's, were you picking up? It's people. It's just people are more relaxed there. There's not as much stress. There's not as much anxiety. There's not as much. Um, you know, you don't you don't get that. But I think the the main point to make about this is you're seeing. So this is the main. This is the main guard station. Is it the men's facility that we're looking at? Yeah. Just no. We're, women's we're, portion. We're okay. not doing anything with men's. This is just just, just, the, just the women's. I just want to be sure yeah. what I was looking at. But if you look at it, you see the main guard station there, and then there are two levels there. It's sort of split level with the mm -hmm. guard station and the and the mid level. Upper level is all common area. Bottom level is more common area, but with desks mm -hmm. and tables. And then you have the living wings right off of that. <laughs> All the services are behind. The, the sort of was taken, you know, that photo was taken with the services to your back. You see the gigantic windows there? Tons and tons of natural light, and that common area up there is, it's just <coughs> all couches. It's built with, a, you know, it's gender, gender informed. It's built for a relational style uh, facility. <coughs> And they have outdoor access right outside those windows, and they have that 24 hours a day. Do the men have anything comparable to this, do you know, at all, on the men's no, side? We didn't see any of the men's stuff at all. I'd just be curious, you know. They're starting to reconstruct for men also. So they're just going through multiple phases on the same site. So that may have something to do in the future. But there, when you went into the close custody area, to me, it was no different than walking down a corridor at Chittenden or Northwest. Right. And very, very yeah. similar. Yeah. Long corridor, gray doors. For the men. Oh, for the uh, even the women. Yeah. 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 That that was very traditional. But this this is, it's it's night, okay. night and day. The can you go back to the first slide with the with the aerial view? But this is not the reentry place. No, this no. is the prison. This is the prison. So <laughs> if, um, if I'm get, all right, so if you look here, this is that hall. This is the main common area right here, and then this is that that one Wings. living the two living yeah. halls, the two two different floors of living hall. This is the other one. Yeah. Back here, you've got Chow Hall, Infirmary, um, Visitation, Programming. Um, there's a uh, a library, uh, an exercise room, and even a hairdresser back there. So if you compare that to Chittenden, yeah. there's none of this sort of disorientation that you get. Everything is right there. You're, it's either the two living wings, the main common area, or the services right behind you. So were there any issues with having that building <coughs> connected to the mail facility? Because whenever we've spoken about campus style or whatever you want to say, the part for the women's facility would be physically separated, completely separated from the male facility in your core. That's how we've sort of envisioned it. This is not. Was there any issues? That, outside of being a booking, sort of, for close custody is an issue, but outside of that, were there any issues? Well, they they did have they have problems with these with these women too, um, who have to go somewhere for programming because they can't go through the, okay. the men's facility without locking all the men up. Right. And which they do. Uh, mm. So there is that aspect. Mm -hmm. I think when we were talking, I, I Carl was saying this is fence rather than building right here that connects the two. I think that's probably true. Open side fence, and most of it did have a roof over, but it was open side oh, okay. fence. So Connor, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just I wanted to point out, <laughs> even at this, so the first reentry facility is full of minimum security, but even in this sort of higher security, I don't even know if they classify as a, min, uh, as a, min, or a medium. medium, but each woman has their own key to their own door. That's so. in their regular facility? That's yes. in the regular yeah. facility. So that's like, even in the higher <laughs> security facility, there's still, there's a, a lot of uh, personal responsibility, freedom of movement. They have their own section. So um, even beyond sort of the reentry, and this, this facility is about, I believe, 15 years older than the newer reentry facility, so. So if there's a violation of that, I would assume there'd be some DRs or something. I, I don't know. They're, their actual practices. I just know it's something that the way the facility's built, they 
work with that in my experience. So I'm curious, if you do that for one gender, do you need to do it for the other? I'm just putting that on the table to yeah. think it through. Yeah. Their, um, the prison in Warren, you know, their, their old state prison was in Thomaston. And I believe they closed that and they built the Warren facility. This was built in 2002. I don't know what the one in Warren looks like, but, you know, the one in Thomaston was sort of comparable to our old Windsor prison. So this old, is probably com comparable prison. to the Springfield facility? That's in, in Newport, we do have dry cells, and they do have keys to the room for the men. In Newport? In Newport, yes. That's where that one was designed. Is that more in those additional beds that we've put in, or is it just... It was constructed that way originally. Originally? Yes. And that was back in the early 90s? <coughs> Six, something like that, I think, yeah. was when we opened. Yeah. It was in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. 93, 94. Yeah. And then in 90, almost 1999, I think we did 116 bed. And the E building was built out of poured concrete instead of concrete block and divided into four units, which we cut a hole in be for due to staffing levels uh, because of the cost of having the four separate units as opposed to one officer being able to watch uh, both living units. But even that building has one side, the dry side, that is, inmates have keys to their, their room. <coughs> the day room's probably not as nice as the one you see here, but they do have the day room. Huh. It's certainly huh. the men's in Newport's louder than this one. This one <coughs> still had that loud feeling to it, but I think, um, I think due to the age, even though it was, you know, 2002, relatively new, there's still some other sound things that you could probably do for it that doesn't have that echoey sound going on in there. So from Maine, you went to Concord, so here you jumped to Michigan. Yeah. There's the okay. random slides. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, not completely random. <laughs> okay. We'll so stay Michigan. in one state at a time. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Michigan, which I visited, and this is considerably bigger facility. This is, co for comparison, that's the size of CRCF. And this is the size of the Michigan facility with 2,400 women. Only women? Only women. 2,400? Wow. Only women, 2,400. And do they have county government there as well? I think they do. Yeah, yeah I think they do. So these are all sentenced? I believe so. Oh, that's So, and, and, you, you'll find a theme for a lot of these. Look at the, the configuration of these, the two wings in the central area, two wings in the central area. A lot of wings in the central area is the kind of design that I see a lot of in prisons now, wings going out from the central area. Uh, there's this one and also Concord um, was the result of a lawsuit. So Michigan had this lawsuit, uh, do I mention the date? Uh, but it was, uh, it resulted in a $150 million settlement for the inmates that sued, and also a lot of restrictions that changed the whole policy for, for Michigan. They were, they were forced into it. Um, and I don't think that, you know, this is my fear of Vermont, is that when people are determining the size of a lawsuit, they don't necessarily take into account the size of the state. So. Vermont had the same lawsuit, we could get hit with a $150 million lawsuit. And so it resulted in this, which is um, a, a big improvement. The other thing that the law specified was that only women corrections officers could supervise in a woman's living unit. Um, and I talked to uh, Joan Spathke about that, and she did point out that she doesn't think that's a good, necessarily a good idea. And which was interesting because I, I assumed that that would be a good idea. And she said, no, that in, in fact, uh, if you have a male corrections officer, it gives them a lot more potential to change the way that the women feel about men. If they're so used to domestic violence and being abused, mm -hmm. abused, they think all men will do this. But if you're a good corrections officer, you can change that make that change, and that's an important change for, uh, for women. 
Uh, so we, uh, my wife and I took about a two hour tour of this and went around most of it. And she liked it. <laughs> it was optional. Uh, and this has the high security fence going around. The inmates do not leave the facility at all. Um, maybe I, th I think that they're allowed to supervise to go out and work around the perimeter, but only if there's corrections officers with them. It's a lot, it's a lot more restrictive environment. But the, um, the, the size of it gives it the ability to have a lot other, of other services. They have full-time psychiatric, full-time medical, full-time personnel that can, that can uh, cover the whole facility rather than having to bring in people for those sorts of things. Yeah, total of 2024. So, Kurt, do, there's 1,000 in minimum, 753 in medium. Are they physically separated from each other? Or are um, they commingled? I believe they're physically separated. There's like different blocks for different things like that. So, they're not commingled, I don't think. <coughs> it looks like they have a baseball field out there, do they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. What was the feeling in that facility as you were walking through? Was it noisy, loud? Was it kind of laid back? Was it tension? Like I wouldn't that? say laid back, but I wouldn't say it was noisy. It was more like um, be between Chittenden and, and Maine, but more on the Maine side. And, you know, you, you when you walk around with a warden, this, uh, this I noticed in Mississippi when I visited down there, you walk around with a warden, how does he interact with the staff and in, with the inmates? And there was really pretty good interaction between them. You know, it wasn't, you know, here comes the warden, look out. It was, hey, warden. And they call the superintendent warden. Uh, I believe so, yeah. And did they call the correctional officers guards? I don't know. I mean, the language, the reason I ask yeah. that is language <laughs> is really, really important. Because mm -hmm. uh, if we need, read the news articles, we always hear correctional officers are guards, and they're not. They're correctional officers. And we talk about the superintendent, and you have a very different vision in your mind when you say vision, when you say warden or superintendent. And the same thing when you say guard, correctional officer. Yeah. It's a very different visual that you have. So, but you, I come away from each facility usually with something that I didn't necessarily expect to get from there. Um, and this one really introduced to me the idea of, of what's called gender awareness um, because, because of the lawsuit, because all of that was explained to me. Uh, so that it reinforced to me the need in training our corrections officers to have them aware of how that works. The other, the other thing was that uh, when I talked to Jen um, Spatsky was, I asked about the training of, of Vermont and whether it's just, they, they, they give an extra week or so of training for corrections officers who are going to be working here. And I believe in Vermont, all the corrections officers get the same training because, and she explained to this, explained this to me that um, women correction officers and men correction officers in Vermont have to deal with women at various stages of their incarceration. So they might be in booking, they might be somewhere else, but you have to, knowing the difference between how you deal with women, how you relate to women, how you get them to do something is important for the whole correction system, not just the women's facility. Part of life. Exactly. Yeah. Operate with women different than men. Wife's happy, wife's <coughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, it was $150 uh, million, dollar, and the economies of scale is what I was talking about. That is funny. You remind me how many, how many people are in there? 2,400. 2,400, thank you. So New Hampshire, we all visited, so everybody jump in when you find me, or a lot of us visited. We didn't like your directions to get there, but that's all right. We got there. We got there. Okay. <laughs> Two roads, same name. Well, Again, we it's um, close to a close to Concord, so fairly close like to the services that they use. Um, it's, again, it's outside the wire of the men's facility, which is right next door here. The women's facility is up here. Um, 
So there's no, there was no fence around the women's facility. 2018, and also again the result, and that was about two decades of lawsuits that finally resulted in the new uh, facility there. 224 bids, and a bunch of you saw, saw the place. Same architect as the main women's reentry facility. Oh, hmm. okay. The other thing too that was interesting, right, in Concord we spent quite a bit of time with the superintendent and um, commissioner of corrections to really talk about things that they learned in the construction, things that they learned, what to do and what they shouldn't have done and wish they had done. Mm -hmm. And they're more than willing to talk to us about some of that. Um, the facility <coughs> felt like a correctional facility. Um, it was softer than ours mm -hmm. and much brighter. Mm -hmm. But it looked like a correctional facility. It did not look at all like the reentry part in Maine. Yeah, this a little, more like a, a little more like a correction. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they all have keys to the door, right. depending on what level of security. Yeah. <laughs> they also just fairly recently, 2018, started using the full body scanners mm -hmm. so that they don't have to do cavity searches and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I forgot, how many women did they have there? I forgot. 234. 24. They weren't full. They're about 180. It's a small footprint, too, I remember. Like the, the acreage yeah. of the facility felt like it was on a. It was on a oh. Right? In, yeah. in New Hampshire? It was 100. And well, it's fairly. 80, no. <laughs> fairly large. Mm -hmm. So all this area, so including the, if you include the parking room. I guess my point, like there's not as much green, there wasn't as much green oh. outdoor space. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Compared to the other places that you've shown us. It was that sort of courtyard, it a little, it's a little bit campus style. Yeah. There. A couple things I noticed was that a right in the middle of a populated area, right? Dead yeah, yeah. right. Very yeah, that, that's, yeah. <coughs> and we drove up, we didn't drive through any fencing or anything like that. We just drove right up the mm. front door and knocked, yeah. knocked yeah. one in. And they did mention that <coughs> with their close proximity to the men's facility, they're, they're very, they're very cognizant of not allowing the women to see the men and the men not seeing the women. As a matter of fact, the men's prison and the men's prison, they blocked off all the windows and doors mm. that faced the, the women's mm. prison. Mm. The women's prison, actually that side of the prison you couldn't see out of other than where we were in a conference room, but I think the other areas were... We're facing the other way. We're facing the other way, yeah. I think. I think you're right. So that, they did separation without a physical barrier, but they did... Uh, That's where they put the windows. Yeah, the way they designed the building and kept separation that way. Well, the windows were up high. And they were very high windows, yeah. Very they kind of did the same thing in Maine, you know, they're by the in the back of the prison there with one living wing set out so you can't see anything on the other one I the other one I think maybe they don't have windows on that yeah. that one side the thing that I think is was really different about Concord and Maine is the common areas this you know this is a common area that looks like a common area in any of our male facilities what I thought was remarkable about Maine was that's a common area for 100 women and it's two levels you know one's more tables chairs desk type stuff the other is more couches and sort of relaxing but I, I thought that that um, I thought that was remarkable and I you know I wish I I, um, I think if we want to get the superintendent over there on the horn at some point and ask her more questions, I think she'd be happy to talk Which with us. The one in Maine? Or the, one? the one in Maine, yeah. I'm curious, I got, in New Hampshire, I was kind of impressed that they had a, a number of different kinds of programming spaces and programs. They had a culinary program and they had, you know, they had, we saw scissors, right? Or, 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 like in this one area where they, you know, they were locked up. But I'm curious, in Maine, did they have, did you get to see the different program spaces? Because there weren't, my sense was that the women could really, they wouldn't be spending all their time in one area that they could go. There were different things happening. 
happening in different parts in New Hampshire and Concord. I think the programming in, um, I don't think they had any vocational programming at the prison. I think it was only in the, uh, okay. only in the no, only in the, in the um, mm -hmm. pre-release center. Got it. Is that right? Does that sound right? Yes. So? Right. There might have been some, you know, like the programming space up top of the library and stuff like that, but nothing really for vocational stuff. Right. There were rooms in that that were before that day room space yeah. that they would be functioning. So. Yeah. And when I say program I use I might use it in a different way than corrections uses it. So I say like I think of programs because some wouldn't correct for vocational. Like, for, for vocational, they have, there was a when we were touring around in New Hampshire, there was a space where women were there like crocheting, like mm -hmm. they were knitting, and just had a sp space. And there were these other rooms where they could go. Um, there was like a sewing area, a craft space that they had different area you know, for evening activities, and they were in a transition. They didn't have their second record. I think they 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 do that in Maine. They do have you know room for rec stuff, and I think they have yoga classes. They like I said, they've got a they've got a library. They got an exercise room. They got a hair salon. But I think the only vocational stuff that goes on there is that they have women working in the kitchen, and that's. But I think that's it. Okay. Yeah, in the laundry. Well, that's that's just in the pre-release the pre-release folks in the laundry. So the, the facility in New Hampshire. Was we we went into a lot of areas that were amazingly quiet and empty, and I kept saying, "Now, this seems like they're on lockdown." And they we asked, "Are they on lockdown?" Oh no, they're not on lockdown. But there were just huge areas that nobody was in. Zero people were in these areas, especially some of the seg units, obviously, and even the commissary. They do the commissary for the entire prison system within New Hampshire, in Concord. The women do that. That big commissary we saw mm -hmm. at the end of the right, hall. Right. The warehouse. So, yeah, the room. it's like a big warehouse. So yeah. if if, so, if a prisoner down at the other prison wants something from the commissary, he kind of uh, they have a system to get him that stuff out of that particular building. There was nobody in that place either. So which which kind of was I thought was a little bit strange, but it, the, maybe they were on lockdown and just didn't want to mention it. But they did take us right into the living units, so that was. Mm -hmm. I think part of that was a layout of the facility, <coughs> is that, you know, having that perimeter, which was exterior wall, which was also their <coughs> perimeter security, mm -hmm. and so you had those long corridors, and we did go by a few of the rooms that had people in them until yeah. you really branched out into, like, that day room where the living units were. Yeah. yeah and we that was one of the downsides that they mentioned with these living units that you see here, where Kurt's head, mm -hmm. is the fact that mm -hmm. a lot of daylight coming in, but the problem being is they still have a mix of male and female officers. So when going by there, uh, you were able to actually look in, and the women had issues with that. But what that provided uh, mechanically was a wonderful thing is the mechanical chase was between the two. So those units were back to back. Uh, and so you don't have any exterior windows in each living uh, unit or in the rooms, but you had it at the end of the corridor at the end of that long day room. So that's where all that daylight, it was glass floor to ceiling, which was a nice feature. But I do think that, you know, if we were to look to do something along those lines, it would still have it so the rooms had access to natural daylight and not have these large glass issues. One of the women commented on that. Yeah, it was, so you, yeah. The, the layout that you have, I, I don't, probably if you stared long enough into one of those pictures you could actually see the toilet and I think I, so yeah. I think that that is part of the problem a lot of the rooms had their lights off as we were walking through and so that was a little detrimental in our facilities between the two doors is where we have the toilet so basically when you're doing you're there officers walking through doing a bed check it doesn't matter male or female you know, you're sort of looking over them because it's a smaller window uh, in the door that right. you're looking through so that, provides a bit more privacy, but then again, there's a lot more to hide behind. So, there's a happy medium. Yeah, and I think, you know, you look at this design there with the glass on the <coughs> side, the glass on the door, I can see in a way why they did that, so that the person wouldn't feel so cooped up. Mm -hmm. You know, you're looking out, you're not cooped up in this room of cement blocks. But the superintendent we were walking through, or warden, I guess she was, she had mentioned that if she had to do it again, she, uh, they wouldn't do the, the glass. The door was yes, but the side glass, uh, probably not so much because of that privacy issue. 
So, but that's a, you know that's a workaround. You know, it, it was still a very nice looking facility. There were other pros and cons to it from you know a BGS point of view for construction, but it was still a nice facility. So that leads into my question, and this is probably totally, totally premature, uh, but BGS lives in your world, and DOC lives in their world, and DOC's world right now is in total chaos, yes. to put it mildly. I mean, they're changing whatever direction they're going to go. And we're pursuing a new facility that then opens up to other things for men as well. Do the women's facility is going to open up a bigger issue for the men in terms of do a standalone or do it part of another <coughs> campus. BGS can design something in BGS's world but may not work in DOC's world. And DOC would need certain needs mm -hmm. to communicate with BGS. So, how are we going to bring those two together when we've got one department that's really trying to stabilize? I, I think we're already doing it. We have calls set up every month. Um, you know, we're, we're still part of the same state organization and we want to achieve the same goal. Um, I, you know, between working with Eric here and then our commissioners back there, I, I feel like we've had great lack of success. I'll just use an example. Like, we have stuff breaking our facilities all the time. We jump on the phone, BGS is there and can fix it. Um, what I think we believe and what BGS will probably say is we're getting to a point where the things that are breaking are bigger and bigger, um, and that's more concerning, our deferred maintenance. So as far as designing it, I think between some of the experiences that legislators that we have at BGS have seen as we go to visit, but also like we're going to pull in experts um, and get their opinion on things as well. But, um, is BGS going to be willing to listen? And I ask that because I'm concerned that BGS will be working within X number of dollars per bed. And we're going to be within those X dollars per bed. And we're not going to have other people telling us what to do without construction. I, well, it is cost I mean, is an that. issue. I heard that. Cost is an issue, so I you're looking that at that, but boss. it's how to, you know, make that work. <laughs> where, where is that fine line when, you know, we have, I've got 30, four or five years plus experience in seeing this stuff and where we do fail in certain areas. I think the, you know, the New Hampshire facility, uh, like I said, they had some issues, but they were all concrete block, uh, filled concrete block. Could you get by with, could it be done faster with precast, similar to what we had down in Springfield and make the areas softer and more inviting, like the day room, the larger lighting, uh, natural light coming in. Yes, I think that that's possible to be working with corrections on and things like that. Uh, the bottom line is, you know, corrections needs, wants, this, and when we put it together to make that all work, well, here's the cost and then potentially where are those cuts? It's the bottom line. Yeah, um, that's what, what they said in, in Concord, too. That they said it would be, a, it, it's going to cost you, they said, well, we can't afford that, so right. let's change right. this, let's change right. this. But I want to make sure that the two departments are working in tandem. Well, there's going to... I'm saying that to BGS, mm -hmm. and I know with DOC right now, it's, we don't have a full-time commissioner in terms of stabilize everything, but we're going to move forward at some point here, I would assume this session. We're trying to figure out the women's facility that then has implications for the whole correction system, mm -hmm. facility-wide. We need to have those two departments working in tandem. Cool. And that's what I really want to emphasize, that those two departments work in tandem. <coughs> for my BGS, that's pretty much standard procedure for us. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we, we meet on a monthly basis with DOC. They come in and, and we discuss the issues on all the facilities you know, and what to do better. Uh, it would be still a, a collaboration going forward of what type of facility to construct and how to construct it. I'm always going to argue for the, you know, heavier is better, because I can always make it a little bit prettier by painting and stuff like that, but concrete's a lot harder to kick holes into than sheet rockets. But is there a level of security 
you know, like when you go to Maine and you go to the reentry facility that you know it's a college dorm and everything else that yes I think that works if we had the population here for that then it can work but you know if you have the population that's slamming books in their doors all the time and you know every month you're replacing the door then the harder roof's better but I think it's it's the whole facility that you got to look at it's not just you know although I probably would argue for make it all hard because it's easier that way for me here it's a population but during that if you're looking at the, the greater needs how to spread that out so over time as the population shifts you're, you're not losing something and having to go back in and re renovate an area to make it harder because well, of the population the state change. Hospital. Yeah. Yes. Okay. From my, my perspective, there's a lot of people that have to work in town to make this work. It's not just PGS and DOC, it's also the training of the corrections officers, it's also the laws that are putting the people there and how long they're there and how whether they can be moved out and whether they'll come right back in again there's a, there's a whole bunch of people that really need to work together in order to make the correction system work in general and for the facilities to properly support them so it's going to take a lot of coordination so then the question becomes to your point Joe's point, point, point everybody's point is it's going to, a lot of it's going to depend on what the legislature decides they want to spend on and, and what value that we get for every dollar spent and what we want to accomplish. Uh, I mean, if we give him, you know, we give you $100,000 a bed and it, what DOC really wants is $120,000 a bed, we're going to have a problem. And spend a little bit of my experience as we always underfund construction projects because we don't get good estimates mm -hmm. good honest estimates and you know I've been Joe and I've been having that conversation <laughs> I wasn't saying a word <laughs> it was a rise, my happy place over here it was a wry <laughs> smile at the moment but and I think that's Alice I think that's what it's going to come down to yeah. you know will the legislature yeah. have the intestinal fortitude to give the DOC and BGS enough money to build a facility that we think is the Right facility for whichever gender population we're building for, because we're just you know we're, we're under stress. The women's facility is soon to be under stress with St. Albans. Mm -hmm. The St. Albans facility itself uh, still have 250 odd prisoners down, at, down in Mississippi. Uh, Multi-year, multi-million. I can't say billion yet, but the longer we go, the closer it's going to get. To that number, you know, you know, what what what's the legislature wants to do? What do our colleagues in the hall want to do, other than nothing? <coughs> or think you can put up a building in six yeah. months? <coughs> or think that no one should be there anyway? Pardon? Or think that no one should be there anyway? Or nobody should be. There. Yeah. So then there's Alaska. Which is There's snow. Yeah. You were there for Christmas or Thanksgiving? Well, that's in July. I wasn't flying over there. <laughs> I was there for Thanksgiving, and there was snow. Yes, it was Anchorage. This is outside of Anchorage. Uh, yeah, 15 miles outside of Anchorage, which is the major population center of Alaska. Um, and this was interesting. I when I came in, the first thing when I met the superintendent or warden, I can't remember which she was. Uh, and the commissioner of corrections was also there, and my wife wasn't. So, yeah. <laughs> well, your daughter was. <laughs> but it, uh, the first thing she said was, "We're all about safety here. That's our primary concern: is the safety of the inmates, safety of the outside population. We're all about safety." Um, Alaska is a more conservative state than than Vermont. She asked about. Um, you know what, what's going on in Vermont and I said well we're trying to reduce the population in prisons by offering these uh, trying to get more community-based services and she said yeah we tried that in Alaska and it didn't work at all uh, um, and so what they uh, my daughter told me afterward that that was controversial they passed the first part of the legislation which was to um, which was to 
fill the, the correct the structure of the corrections, but they've neglected to, they never got to the second part, which was the supporting the community services. Oh, really? So oh, you only got one part of it done, yeah. and so it didn't work. So if, that's why I say things have to be done in tandem. You have to really have the legislation that supports the kind of facilities that you're trying to, to maintain. Um, this was a very, but this was a very interesting facility. Uh, most of it looked like this. This was the entrance to the main part. But, I mean, you can see that you're talking wooden walls and things like this on the outside. Uh, these other units in the back, the same kind of... So that's a whole correctional facility there within that circle? Just for yeah. women. Is yeah. it just for women or yes. are there men there too? No. It, they had some men there at the beginning and they said, we got to get them out. And they took them men out of there. And, they said it improved it a lot. That's the other way around. I made, I made a snide remark. Uh, the men were all right. They made it for a moment, yeah. <laughs> but these, these are smaller units. Um, and there's one of them that's faith-based. Where, where, and there's another one that's they have different kind of, where they're all living together and, and uh, with a more religious attitude towards it. It's not a specific religion, mm -hmm. but it, um, and there's another one that's uh, for uh, drug abuse, drug rehabilitation, so that everybody's a drug-free mm -hmm. unit like that. And everything is earned in this one. That's they're very big on accountability and earning what you get. So you don't get a um, tablet. You have to buy your tablet yourself. You have to uh, earn the the right to have a tablet. You, they had different colored shirts for different places, different uh, units, so mm -hmm. people felt they kind of stood out when they, you know, I'm, I'm a member of this unit, so I'm not like the general population, I'm a little bit better. Uh, they had a lot of, and I've run into this at a couple other facilities, and I don't, I need to find out still about Vermont, how much community interaction there is. The community being what? Uh, outside the community. Outside the community, yeah. not community so, interaction within different... Right. Segments. Actually, there's a point on that too, because they said if you do this sorts of thing, you want to keep these um, smaller units separate from the general population as much as possible, because the faith-based and the drug abuse ones and things like that, they, they don't mingle that much. They don't live in the same proximity. So they separate them more in terms of um, not their classification of security, but more in terms of what they're dealing with on a daily basis or what their belief system is or that type of thing. Program Perhaps, needs. yes, but I think you probably you still have to earn the, to get there. The, the right to live in, in one of those. And so facilities. do they have minimum security and medium security in this facility, do you know? I would say not. I is didn't see a big only, separation. Is, there only, is this the only women's facility? Yes. Yeah. So they would have both yeah. classifications. The, other, the, the community interaction, like they grow flowers and have a flower sale out in the community. They have concerts in here. They bring the community in for concerts. The, in Mississippi, they, uh, the, the warden there said that they have a, um, a the, the prisoners pay for a McDonald's meal. In Mississippi or yeah. Michigan? Mis Mississippi. They pay for uh, McDonald's comes and delivers, and the money that goes to the that bought the meals that the prisoners buy goes to the community. There's a lot. Of, I've run into this a lot in places where they're trying to improve the relationships between the outside community and the, and corrections. And I don't, I haven't seen that yet in Vermont. For all, for all I know, it exists that that we do that sort of outreach in the community. But, well, we used to a little bit with some of the agriculture growing. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. up in St. Albans they did a little bit, not particularly when we had um, Teresa Snow with Salvation Farms. That went to food banks and family centers and yeah. all of that. They also had a big craft sale where they would make things for kids. They have that in Maine. They yeah. have that in Maine. And this was built in 1974, which is quite a while ago. But it still looks, see, uh, yeah. No, let's go back. Yeah. So it still looks very modern. 
for being having been built. But the other thing to remember is that Alaska in 1974 had a lot of money. Yeah, the oil. They had the oil money, and they also had a fairly good budget. Now their the oil has dropped. Their budgets dropped. Their uh, their ability to finance something like this has probably been limited, much more limited now. But all of our correctional facilities, when you approach them, you know it's a correctional yeah. facility. Yeah. They're all concrete. You know that. This does not give you the impression at all. It gives you an impression it could be a library, it could be a campus uh, building, um, it could yeah. be anything, but not a correctional facility. It doesn't give you that impression I believe this, this does have a wire perimeter. Mm -hmm. But... <clears throat> so you drive up here. Yeah, the entrance to the facility actually is over here. So the wire is more around here. Um, so you don't see it coming up. So, so you're right, it doesn't look like a prison. I mean, all of our prisons look like prisons mm -hmm. when you're driving up to them. Yeah. 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 And. <coughs> Entry facility in Maine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what, because that's what we're used yeah. to being free. But that's the thing that, that, that difference is important when you're talking medium and higher security. Did you pick up any difference in, in the staff and how the staff, they said any that tension or between the four facilities? I've asked, you know, do people want to work here? Do you have trouble getting staff? And the people in Alaska said we have no. Uh, all the corrections officers want to work here in the here, um, partially because it's close to Anchorage. <laughs> it's not often the, the the real boonies of of, of Alaska, um, but they also like the the atmosphere and the people in it, things like that. Um, Michigan had some very interesting problems I found with. They had, because they had the restriction of only women could supervise women, they also then were confronted with another lawsuit by women who said they couldn't advance in corrections because they were stuck in that facility. They couldn't, they wanted to be able to get out and, and experience the other thing, get the experience necessary and, and the increase in job responsibility that they could get at other facilities. So they were suing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard, you know, there's, it's Can't hard win. to tell what happens there. Um, the main, there was one that they, there was one that they said that the men don't, I think it was, actually I think it was Chicken that said that they, the men don't necessarily like to work there. They, they don't, they didn't want to deal with women. You know, they, didn't, <laughs> they didn't go into corrections in order to deal with women. They like things cut and dry and you know, it's a different attitude. Which, women which, are not cut and dry. You know, you exactly. get more, more than a couple women together, you've got a handful. Yeah. <clears throat> but, I mean, I'm saying that bluntly is a woman. You know? They're very different to work with than women. But the big thing that I got out of yeah, shadowing... Uh, what did you say? I said, yeah, we get things done. <laughs> We spoke about this last year, but to your question about uh, sort of these, let's call them more new age or progressive thinking facilities in higher, um, North Dakota has done it across their prison system, including their maximum security. So if that's something that interests you, um, you can look at that system as well. They have visited Norway. They're super, or they're, I don't think it's a commissioner, but commissioner, deputy commissioner came back and started making some immediate changes. Um, and to your point, I believe um, Norwegian's model when we were talking about community is they want to basically create good neighbors. So when you leave, it's part of that community again. You can be a neighbor. Um, and, you know, they're, they are, uh, they have a much different system. I'm not trying to compare the U.S. system in Norway, but 
Um, I know that North Dakota has taken some steps after what they saw there. Um, a lot of it's programming. And it's great for our correctional officers, too. You know, once you have options where tensions are a lot lower, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot, it, you know, mm -hmm. it helps everybody. Maine, was, Maine's also sending their staff to Norway, too. They're, they're rotating people in, in and out of there. Yeah. Well, when I when I shadowed the corrections officer at CRCF, it was it was actually very good because uh, he was floating, which meant that he went around and took different jobs at, to relieve somebody at one thing. So I wasn't fortunately stuck in the control room unlocking and locking doors for eight hours. Mm -hmm. So he showed me that and I stayed there for about 15 minutes and then we go somewhere else. And I was on the unit, um, he was relieving somebody, just, you know, you can go get, go get lunch and all, and we'll take care of it. And so I was there. And the unit, I'm not sure which one it was at, at CRCF, but it had a, uh, I think the day room was about the size of this room. Um, and then the hall going off with the, and we were standing there, he was doing paperwork and uh, one of the inmates came in and she was kind of waiting at the door and he said, uh, you know, what's going on there? And she said, uh, oh, I'm going out to, to work, you know, to do the work around the facility. And uh, he's, she said, that, that'll be good, yeah. And, and she said, but I, my head's in a bad place. I'm, I'm really not feeling that good today. And I noticed that he didn't respond, that he just kind of kept working on his thing. And and then I think he might have said something, you know, like, you know, um, how are you doing again or something. And she said, I'm really not feeling right well at all, you know. And, and he said, well, maybe you ought to write up a slip for mental health. You can go talk to mental health. And she said, yeah, okay, that's probably a good idea. And so they did that and left. And we left and he said, uh, later, he said, "You know that I should I should not have asked her how she was doing. That was because it then it just spiraled down, and she started using that, and she ended up not going out. She, and which is what she really would have been the mm -hmm. best thing for. Her. Mm -hmm. But because, and he said, the hardest thing is for new corrections officers is to not be a friend." Now, I, I talked to a couple of people. I, I talked to my manager. I explained the same story. My man, the town manager, and he said, yeah, public safety is like that. Our cops are. That's why we have four floating social workers who go to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. I talked to my cousin, who is a Unitarian minister, and she, as I was explaining to her, I was thinking, oh, that just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a good excuse. You really, you, got, you, have, to be, you have to be human. Yeah. And the, the thing is that, if you ask, what is the job of a corrections officer in, in Vermont? You know, what is their role? And, and it's not to be their friend, to be their counselor, to be there to rehabilitate them. The, the person who is a corrections officer, and, and I, I'd like to show you, the job description doesn't talk about um, making prisoners feel good and things like this. It's all about treatment, um, supervision, custody, uh, things like that. That are all. It's a safety issue more than it security. is a security of the yeah. facility. And that's where the training comes in. It is because and I talked to, to Jen about this too. It's very difficult for somebody to learn how to put up an appropriate barrier between them and the inmate. Inmates who are criminals and very good at manipulating people, and they, they do it all their lives, so you don't want to get sucked into something that's going to cause you problems down the way, but you also have to be human and be able to help them out. And that's a really, that's why in Norway it takes two years before any corrections officer comes into a facility and actually starts working. They're trained as social workers more than as prisoners. Well, well, we, you know, we have a six-week program. Um, Mississippi had a one-week program. <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, and, and of course, the people in the water get paid more. It, it, uh, each prisoner, as I've heard, ranges from ninety to $120,000 per inmate in Norway. 
So on the other hand, their recidivism is down to 20 or something like that, where ours is at 120 or uh, 60 or 70, yeah. 50. So that saves you money. So where do you put your money? In training or do you put it in larger facilities? If we had the recidivism rate that Norway has, we, we could we would have build a facility for the whole of Vermont with 450 beds. But it's to get there. <laughs> yeah. It's to get there. Yeah. It's, and to, and to it's not. It's a 10 year lag to get there. It's a 10 year lag to get there by the time you start. Oh, yeah. 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 In terms of the recidivism rate. Oh, yeah. we're going to work on that. So everybody's got ideas about how their particular idea saves money, but it takes a coordination of all those to really make it work. The best way is Andy Donahue said don't arrest people. Remember Andy saying that? Yeah. Don't yeah. arrest people. Don't arrest anybody. From Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Did you so, have something? I do. So, Kurt, I'm, I'm kind of fooling around here at the internet a little bit, looking at Alaska DOC website and all that kind of cool stuff. It looks like they have about 12 men's facilities and a warning women's facility. Mm -hmm. Some are better than others. Uh, do you have any feel for how many? And, and I understand why they have so many facilities. They just huge state, but some of the facilities are really big, really, really big. In Alaska? Yeah. They don't have that much population. Yeah. The population is not the same as Vermont. Yeah. 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 They get some big, huge <coughs> facilities. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. They don't have much population in terms of people. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I'll show you. Yeah. So anyway, so my, I guess my question is, did, did you ever even think about it, uh, trying to find out how many total Total uh, people they have incarcerated in Alaska? No. No. Okay. There's a, that's just a, that's one of 12. That's a pretty big facility. How many else? Yeah. Jesus. I do have budget numbers on for Maine if you're interested okay. in that at any point. It, and I don't mean anything, I'm just saying it. It just seems yeah. to me that they've got a lot of people. I'm looking down their facilities, various facilities, yeah. they've got a lot of people. Why don't we go with Carl and Kurt about your thoughts on when your shadow correctional officers and your discussions and Carl, you look a little bit more intently have different issues with corrections and bring us all up to speed here. There was one one thing that I wanted two things that I when I think about it that I would want to add. When I was in the Chipman facility at one point with uh, one of the officers, and I mentioned the slamming doors, and he said, well, you know, that those slamming doors, they're, they're good. Because when I walk through and I hear the door slam in back of me, I know that it's secure in back of me. And you mean the salad boards? No, just the, well, no, the doors between the door. uh, unit and the hall, between the hall and the... Right, the area you go in. You open the door. You open, that's your salad board. board. No, at, we're talking, it's not the double doors. <laughs> Anytime you go into a unit, you have to buzz in. Right. And they open the door when right. you go they in. They don't open that door until you're in this confined area. <laughs> No. Well, sometimes they're at the end of a hallway. Yeah, That's yeah. you're going happens. through a hall to another one or something. So when that door slams, he says, I know that that, there's nobody, that, that door is secure and nobody's going to come up behind me. <laughs> there the, was a correctional officer. Yeah. How long have you been in the system do you know? I don't know. I think a while, quite a while. See, and there's in, a real culture. In, That's the thing. There's yeah, and in Michigan, the guy said, you know, some of these women are vicious. They've killed their kids, they've burned their husbands, they've done terrible things. These are, you know, we have to have facilities for these kind of people. You're not, it can't be all that nice. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's a fact. It is still, you still don't, you don't want to lose sight of what the facility's for. Yeah. I have mentioned to several people things, what, what you said one day, Butch. When people get mad at the overcrowding of the correctional system and everything, I says, well, I says, one of our committee members, Butch, I says, just remember, we don't invite, we, we don't invite them in. They come knocking on our door, and if you don't believe it, you look at the papers on Monday morning. Yeah. So you're going to do is watch, watch the, uh, 
Raymond Day. Yeah, because yeah, they had legislative visit in the courtroom, and I did. <laughs> so what, what were you picking up, Carl, on your... Um, I know that, uh, well, when I went to Maine, um, the superintendent there talked about um, how they didn't have slamming doors there. And that was something that she was very proud of, and she seemed to really think that that changes the tenor of the facility. There's one thing that she, they don't, they don't have a loudspeaker, they don't have a loudspeaker system there, so the guards have to yell from the guard station. And she said that's one thing that they would, as soon as they can, they're going to put a loudspeaker in. Because they don't want yelling, they don't want slamming doors. Those are two things that they felt are real triggers for women. So where did you hear that, Kurt, about the slamming doors? That, that, that was in Chittenden. That was in Chittenden. Yeah. And, but what Carl, I mean, what Carl says is backed up by what other people have said to me. You know, if you've got women who are incarcerated for domestic abuse with men that are yelling at them, mm -hmm. With do slamming doors, it's it, it is a trigger. But on the other hand, <laughs> there's always a. But on the other hand, okay. So, what else did you pick up, Carl? Um. So, are we just talking about Chittenden, or are we talking about? No, all of it. All of it. Um. I went to the MAT lines at all four of the facilities that. I went to and uh, the MAT line in Chittenden started at it started at 5 a.m. You were there at 5 a.m. I was there at 5 a.m. for the start. <laughs> I got there at 4. I got there at 4:30. Um, and what's that? What time did you leave home? 3:30. <laughs> no traffic. <laughs> um, it. it and they have to do that there because they, that's the only time they can have the programming space. The programming space during the rest of the day is used for other stuff. At all the, all the other facilities, it was much later, much later in the day. Um, and what I've, what I've watched with that is the sort of level of stress that the MAT line puts under um, puts the guards under, particularly in the male facilities. I think that they're, they have two guards there and they might have 20 Correctional inmates. Officers. I'm sorry, 20, yes. 20, 20 inmates, 20 correctional, or two correctional officers for that MAT line. And they have to pull people off of the units. It, it increases, um, uh, it, it increases over time and it also leads to having less people on the units. And I would be curious to know about what, what happened in Springfield. That was like 10 in the morning? Oh, I'll not to take over, but the, the altercation yeah. happened there. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember when it was. What time, whoops, what time of day? Anyways, the, the two things I heard from corrections officers were that the MAT thing was a real, a real challenge. And... Well, there's there's challenges operationally with pulling people off of units to su supervise the line. There's the issue of security on the line. Um, there's more issues than yes, no, that's on. that's sort of the operational piece. The other piece they talked about a lot is why, are, and this this came from some of the PNP folks too. There are people being inducted who have have no no history and and they just want to serve their time high, which. That was that was the complaint of a lot of them. Um, now, whether that's an education issue for the correctional officers, whether that's a, uh, a procedural issue in terms of induction, whether it's both, I don't I don't know. But that's that's what I heard. Um, and the other the other piece that I heard from them too was just the overtime piece and and. Uh, what a toll that's taking on, on them. Those were the those were the takeaways for me. Were you picking up on both ends? Both you folks picking up real morale issues with our officers. I heard that, that at Chittenden, 
Yeah. But the other ones, the people I've talked to weren't as familiar with the other, the rest of the system. But, you know, when you're working the kind of hours that Carl's talking about, and then something like this hits the news, hmm. and people see you in a corrections uniform outside, you know, when you're on your way to work or something, they get... It's not the kind of place that you. It's not the kind of place you want to work. The kind of job you want to have. One of the things that bums me out is that every every time, every facility that I went to, I remember saying at least once to a corrections officer there, um, saying that that, the, that I appreciated their work and that they don't. They have no bigger advocate and champion than the commissioner, and the commissioner's gone now. Because he, you know, he, he was always in here talking about the quality of the people and the hard work that they did. And, I, and you see that if you go there. And you, you, you can tell that people are putting a brave face on it, but I, I get the sense that the morale's not great. Um, so I have um, several <coughs> COs that work at Northwest State that live in my district that contacted me this summer after they resigned. Um, and it was because of the overtime. One of them was in a pretty bad accident uh, on his way to work. He fell asleep because he had less than four hours of sleep between shifts. And they made it very clear to me that they liked the job. They liked what they were doing. They felt it was important. It was better paid benefits than most jobs offered. And yet, they were so overworked, one of them just about died on his way in because of the overtime. So I, I really think it goes beyond morale. These people are seriously afraid that even getting to and from work, it was a 15 minute drive from where he lived. It, it, it wasn't an hour long commute. So if he's falling asleep, on the way to work and then going into work that tired how and, is, and how that is that the other you know. safety is mm -hmm. in their minds they see something hit the news like the incident at Springfield and they wonder would I even have enough energy to deal with that right I, well, they're I, always I, on because their adrenaline is going yeah, that's I, happening so just on the morale issue um, I know they came to me this this fall and one just a month and a half ago um, to express to me how frustrated they were. And I thought that was relevant in this discussion. Did they talk at all about feeling supported by their superintendent, or feeling supported or not supported by their superintendent or case supervisor, shift supervisor? Did they talk about that at all? <clears throat> in very unkind terms. So was it they weren't supported by the folks within that current within the facility or central office? Inside the facility, they felt that inside Northwest State it was very much a supervisors and a CEOs club, and there was a severe difference and lack of respect both ways. And I've picked that up in the correctional officers that work in Springfield because I've approached them when I see you know <laughs> out in the community <coughs> purposely. Yeah go up and ask, and I've heard the same thing. I've asked specifically, because when we hear, we feel that higher up we don't have our, nobody has our back, mm -hmm. Yeah. we immediately think it's central office, and I really wanted to find out <coughs> where that was, so I specifically asked, is it within the facility, the building, is it your shift supervisor, is it the superintendent, is it central office up in Waterbury, where, and they said it's inside the building. It's not central office. Because it, we always jump to central office. So I just want Yeah, no, it was conveyed to me on more than one occasion that the superintendent in uh, Northwest State was very punitive towards people that did not see him favorably mm -hmm. and shuffled people into positions that they should not have been in because of that. But that's a personal issue, and I'm only hearing one side of that story. So I do want to make that clear as well. <coughs> right. Bless you. Bless you. Did you hear, either one of you hear any of that? And you are talking with officers that they didn't feel that somebody had their back? I heard that once. I 
think officers came to the Women's Caucus in last year and were, were distressed about the overtime issue. Um, you know, we hear it too, though, like, you know, with the Brattleboro retreat, like there's a, the, the, in a 24-7, a, a facility that operates 24-7 for the safety of the facility, you have to have a full, full staff. And so this mandatory overtime is a challenge. And I've heard from, um, in corrections when, you know, it's just not very attractive to recruiting new members. And when we have a workforce shortage in the state, right. it's, it's exacerbated. Too. And so if we're thinking about a new facility, I do, you know, I really now, even more than ever, like to think about location to workforce. And then the other piece is like, you know, could there be with a, a training program, like, you know, better training, would it, you know, all of those <coughs> We're talking are, about a culture shift. Yeah. That's what we're really talking yeah. about. It's a culture how do we shift. Help shift. How do we do that? I wish I could talk about what I talked to Jim about today, but I'm going to let him tell you about it. About the culture shift? Everything. Within everything. corrections or everything. within what he saw when he was in Rutland? No, here. Jim Baker. The other thing that I ran into. He's. He's seen all this. All right. Mm -hmm. Two and a half days in the yeah, two and a half. He said that's, that's what he said to me as well. Yeah. Two and a half days in the job, he's already. Yeah, wondering why he's doing it. You know, he knows why he's here. But wondering why he took the job on. But no, I mean, you know, he went through this with the yeah. Butler and with the Butler PD. Yeah, that's why he's brought on. So, to the employee piece in the overtime, a few years back, Perry, you remember now, so maybe we will. We were using, Hoffman. Yeah, we were using sixty to seventy temps. Maybe more at the time. More. And uh, yeah, it might have been a, a lot yeah. more than that. And there was a lot of discussion about why are we hiring temps mm -hmm. and yeah. not full time COs. Mm -hmm. So so work was done as a position pilot or something like that I don't remember. It was a million dollars extra. Yeah, to, to do away with uh, with temps and hire more full time COs. And uh, and, and I think that's right. I mean, I, I think uh, we're probably better served full-time <laughs> full corrections officers and not using uh, temporary COs. But the problem then became, you know, you can't hire a CO. We have 60 positions open or 50 positions open and can't fill them. So I don't know where we are on the temp level, but I think our temp level is still down. I think it is also, which creates more of a problem because of the overtime. Yeah, now, now we have no, no employees, which now is boosting the overtime, and which they didn't have before. Of course, overtime is really great until you have to work, yeah. you know, three eights of oh, overtime. Overtime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets to be a real problem. <coughs> now that's become a, a real big problem. So it's all fast. Kind of a catch-22 situation that's been created by good intentions. The problem is, is I think we all, I, ne I never realized that our employment situation would look like it is today on the dearth of people looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we might find, and, and Alice just said, I think we might find that the new interim commissioner may have some innovative ideas on how to solve some of those problems. Uh, yeah, they might not be accepted. They might not be accepted. They may not be accepted, but you'll have some innovative ideas. <laughs> you're not, not going to listen to the guy you hired to fix the problem, and maybe you should have hired the guy. The way that I see it, being on the outside, and it's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but I think the MAT shows, is an example of this, that one thing we've heard from correctional officers is, well, we're here for the security, we're not here for, to be social workers. Um, and I think you look at the, pay, the level of pay, and then you look at the, the um, you need to have a high school diploma or equivalent GED. And, you know, you look at that, and you, say, you know, 30 years ago, fine. I don't know when was the last time we really looked at the credentials of a correctional officer. And that's not to negate who's there now by any means, but I think we've become, come to a point in our culture, 
And also, we, with all the initiatives that we've done within corrections, the folks who are now being incarcerated are a very different group of folks than they were incarcerated 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with much more severe mm -hmm. issues. You're dealing with more mental health issues. You're dealing with much more social issues than you were before. Um, and that changes the culture within a facility. And, 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 and your correctional officers are your frontline people to interact with the offender. And, and I think there needs, we struggled with this with the mental health piece. <clears throat> back in the 90s that correctional officers really needed more help in their training for understanding and working with mental health folks. Correctional officers aren't going to be therapists, but there needs to be an understanding that if someone's in a mental health crisis, you don't slam a door or yell at them. That makes it worse. But if you're coming from a point of security, it's a whole different mode of reacting. And so that's where I get into saying it's a culture shift. And that's going to be very, very difficult to make, and it's going to take a long time to do it. <coughs> the other thing that I ran into or <coughs> was mentioned to me was that um, the corrections officers move, might move from being corrections officers to probation and parole. Mm -hmm. And the two jobs are very different. Mm -hmm. <coughs> inside the, and there isn't, from what I understand, there isn't a lot of training to make, to move you to that. So when you're a corrections officer in prison, things are very cut and dry. If the prisoner does this, then you do this. This is your reaction. If they, and but when you get out into probation and parole, and you're managing people in the community, you want to, you need to be able to look at other ways of dealing with things rather than just hauling them back to prison, which is what, which is one of the reasons why we get so many people coming off furlough into prison is because the people managing them are think, manage them as prisoners, which is what furlough is. You know, it's an extension of the walls. But this, this person mentioned that there's no, there's no rewards that, that he can give. Now what's up? Sorry. Just came up to hear what's going on. Hear what's going on? Yes. I just wanted to, to be something I needed to know. For corrections? Yeah. You never know. Hi. <laughs> you want to be a correctional officer? <laughs> she already is. Yeah. I was going to say she has. She's got 180 inmates. <laughs> so, so the problem was this person thought that they're the people he was managing, a couple of them, were doing a really good job mm -hmm. and wanted to reward them. So he said, you know, it would be nice to be able to say, well, let's go down Church Street and get a cup of coffee. You can't do that. You know, you can't start, you don't give anything to want somebody you're managing, you don't receive anything from somebody you're managing. Because then you get into this gray area. Transactional gray area. And so that's what you know, that's, they need to be trained for some way of managing that. We need to be able to come up with ways of rewarding <coughs> good behavior. We're not rewarding it, but short of bringing them back into prison. So what, what were you picking up, Carl? Um, I, I talked to... P&P folks, um, mostly about MAT, about security, where they were, and that seemed to be, for the most part, good, with the exception of Newport. Newport P&P is in the courthouse, and it's, uh, they have all sorts of public walking through there. Their security is kind of, they've got a sheriff's deputy there at the front door and a metal detector, but um, it's not, not ideal. Um, I think that probably what I think that I think the MAT situation made the sort of hiring and workforce challenges and probably think those things were happening or had started when MAT came on but MAT probably just made it worse, worse. Yeah, yeah it just highlighted yeah it just it just took yeah and I'm and I'm not I'm not saying that because I disagree with MAT at all. I mean I think MAT is, it's it's the right thing to be doing, but um, 
it just came at a at an opportune time for where we are with hiring and uh, workforce development. So, did you hear anything from the correctional officers in terms of how they are kept abreast of changes that m might be coming down from central office, such as MAT races to that level where there's a new program or new institution of policy or something? How does that get tra trans? transferred or translated to the correctional officers? How are they made aware of it and what support are they given? Any I, I didn't hear anything about that. I did hear concern about the, the, the time frame with which MAT was developed and then implemented. That that was sort of <laughs> rushed and out of, out of the blue and really... Yeah. But has that settled? I think it's settled, but I think, there's some, I think there's some lingering lingering bad feelings about it and then it continues to add to the overtime burden. So I think that's that might be part of that. Hmm. Well, that's a real concern that we've had because MAT got away from us. We well, sure did money wise. Yeah. Passed the bill, we expected yeah. 200 or less and yeah. now well, we're up 750, 800 yeah. because of change in, our, in the federal rules. Yeah. And I just reread the bill a medically necessary thing and, and all that stuff. The, but the rules that were in place when we passed it, there would have been only about 200 people. Mm -hmm. but, but the big but is now we have 750 or so, I guess. Uh, so they really got away from us. I mean, we were told it was going to cost 800 to 900 thousand dollars, and it's how many millions now? Two three. Two point something. I think it's two point something. Yeah, we're in millions now. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the whole bill is based around those those facts. Right. So and I understand what we're saying, yeah, this is this is not out of control, but we're starting to see actually the numbers we saw this summer they're starting we're starting oh, to see yeah. that taper back down. The diversion yeah. numbers and diversion numbers are higher than ever. That's what I was <coughs> that's what I was hearing too when I was here. But and the were officers talking about that, the diversion? Piece, or where were you hearing? I think um, I'm trying to remember now, but what I was hearing was that the diversion numbers weren't getting any better mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the summer went on. Well, we heard this summer that we're an anom anomaly uh, in, in that. Is any other states that have Doing are doing math or are introducing math, their diversion rates are going down. Mm -hmm. We're the only state with diversion rates going up. So there's something suspect okay. there. I have my yeah. thoughts, but I'll keep it to myself. But well, I think that, I mean, I'm, this is just speculation mm -hmm. here, but that might get back to that issue of people being inducted who don't need to be, al along with introducing a new currency. I spoke to a constituent, um, constituents who had a uh, big brother, big sister, and he had been in our correct facilities, and he he said that people were going on MAT because they want when they wanted to stay in Vermont because, well, because they, right, not that's another yeah. right. So yeah. it's another incentive. But my point is only that it's that there's a little bit of an incentive to go on it. I know you're supposed to be a do you're, so you're supposed, to be, supposed screened, to be screened, screened and assessed. assessed. Substance but use disorder. I think that's a, I wonder if For, that's a factor. Did you say, I'm, I'm sorry, I might have missed something. Did you, you know, say so women some, wanted to stay in Vermont? So no, they want to stay in Vermont, not go to Mississippi. Women? No, no, man. no this oh, is okay. a man. Yeah. Uh, I didn't no, hear that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. So, yeah, so if you wanted she to mumbled. stay, yeah. I mumbled, so if you wanted to stay in Vermont, yeah, MIT was a yeah. way to, to do that. I spent a lot of time in St. Johnsbury talking to the Centurion folks. The next facility I went to, I don't remember which one it was, I was told that the Centurion people were told specifically not to talk to me. <laughs> they called ahead? Yeah. Centurion that called you? That was not made clear, but the Centurion people were not going to talk to me. And who, and who told them not to? I, I don't know. I don't know. Wow. One of the COs. Yeah. It's St. Johnsbury? 
No, no, at St. Johnsbury, St. Johnsbury, I, I spent quite a bit of time with the Centurion folks talking about MAT. You should have let me know you was there. I would have come down. Yeah. Well, what was the next facility? I think it was, um, it was either Newport or Chittenden. I think it was Newport. I'd say Newport would be most likely. Yeah, it was Newport. Yeah, because that's where they had the most problems. Right. In terms of and there was a fight there that day during... With people who had just come off the MAT line. And did you do any other work with DOC obsession? Is that something up pretty much what you did? Just those four in state visits and then with the PMP folks mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. um, the facility visits and then the two out of state visits. And this all finished before the Chittenden article appeared? Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. I was at Chittenden, I think, early September. Because one thing we can transition to, I'm looking at the time, 24. We just got, as I was talking earlier, Appropriations <coughs> Committee, budget mm -hmm. adjustment. Teresa just came in. Did you get a copy of this at all, Phil? No. If I've got it by email, I wonder if it's something we can quickly do in the next 20 minutes. 24. I'll just say one more thing, Madam Chair. Yeah. I'm really glad I spent that time this summer to do that. Because I, I don't, I, I feel like I, at least I have some education on what we're talking about here in, mm -hmm. in, in this committee, and I don't, it would be much more difficult to be having some of the dis these discussions that we're going to have to have without without having done that. So I'm, I'm really glad I took the time to do that. It was time well spent. Thank you for doing that. Thank you, Kurt, for doing all your chores, all your trips. That was good. Yeah, I I like it. <laughs> Learn a lot. It's always something. So I'm going to quickly <sighs> shift gears here to budget adjustment appropriations. Did you you didn't get anything by email Thank by you. Teresa? Up no. This is a paper copy. She said there wasn't much, but you know once we start working on it, they need it by Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm thinking if we could spend some time. Today, do you want to? Boy, the, the internet is. That's really weird. It is weird. Today, right? Is it slow or? It's been just like awful intermittently. Yeah. Yes. This is kind of weird. <laughs> Thank you. I'm okay. glad you were here. That's why you found it. Let me look at this <laughs> real quick. She just handed it to me. So. <laughs> equipment revolving fund. Is that in your bailing? What is the equipment revolving fund in your like BGS or is that? No, I'm not, I don't know. The revolving fund? Captain and Captain and the Securities. I don't know. What's the name? They highlight anyway. information technology needs and shall be tracked and reported separately from other equipment. So that's IT issues for yeah, us. That's, no. the start of, that's the start of something great. Maybe. Are they putting IT in there? Will no. you give them any security eligibility? No, no, no. Okay. This is something different. There's an equipment revolving loan fund. Okay. Equipment revolving fund that each department feeds into. And then it's to, departments can use that when their equipment needs to be upgraded. And they do have IT that they take out of this as well. Okay. And I think they just want to carve that out. Shall be used for the intended purpose of establishing revolving loans for information technology te needs. So that's our IT needs. So to take the pressure off the capital, they want to take the pressure off general fund, but there isn't much money for that. Um, let's see. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Transportation fund. Carry forward. 
payroll. We don't get into payroll. I don't know why they hide it. Where was our stuff? Probably gave you the wrong packet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just kind of wondering what's going on. No, it's addressed to me. This doesn't make sense. Kurt, what were you mentioning yesterday that you thought? Oh, the Supreme Court? <clears throat> yeah. I'm working on that. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how that works. I need to talk to Catherine Bannon about it. I don't see. Any adjustments we have to make? I don't see the Supreme Court. Us. Between the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court. What am I missing? The, is that the total order they said that every It must be, but I'm highlighted your. No, I'm not looking at the ones that are highlighted. None of it pertains to us. It was a started the primary. It was a $25 million one that was started later. Capitalization of the IT. That's the only thing that I see. That's it. Is it an IT program? No. Transfer to BGS. It's a remodel. Transfer to the BGS Equipment Revolving Loan Fund to capitalize an IT revolving fund sub account. Do you know anything about that? This sounds really strange. I do not. That's the only thing. Giving money to us to capitalize an IT. That's the only thing that pertains to us. I cannot do it. Yeah, that's what I would think. I know. That's why I shifted gears. Yeah. Okay. I can ask my money. Has he been around? Are we on the record? Kind of. Um, yeah.